Hello everyone, I'm back here with another video and this one is a review, a book review. Now I said before actually that I wouldn't do any more book reviews on this channel unless they had to do with like business and entrepreneurship, like you know stuff I need to do with freelancing or with language, uh, language and literature, stuff like that because you know it's freelance translators we deal with languages. This has to do with language. It's it doesn't have to do with, with uh, translation per se, but it does have to do with languages and I found it extremely interesting and I enjoyed it a lot. I enjoy anything on languages, so I am going to do a review of it. Hopefully you guys have some interest in languages, you know, since you're interested in translation, so you should find it interesting as well. This, um, this book is called Empires of the Word, uh, A Language History of the World, and it's by Nicholas Ostler, um, who's a British author um from oxford and who speaks something like what is it uh i thought it says maybe it says it online i looked it up something it says he has working knowledge of like 26 different languages or something anyway um this is a fascinating book absolutely fascinating it goes through the history of a bunch of different languages um all throughout the world and more specifically it talks about why some languages stick why some of them thrive why some of them thrived in the past and uh, why some of them don't stick at all and, uh, and you know, aren't, uh, you know, and aren't spoken as much. Some of them are spoken a lot and some of them very little and he's trying to see the reason why. And it's not as clear as you would think because um, here are my notes. Oh, and actually while I'm at it, I should talk about it. I think I've have, I might've mentioned it before or not, but whenever I read, I always use this. I've gone through all different things of writing in books, not wanting to write in books, having a note and this and that, or going on the first page and just writing stuff. But I found this online. Uh, I can't remember where, but if you look for it, the fast book outliner, I don't know if you can read that. Um, and it's, uh, they have different versions. I like this version three because what it lets you do is circle the pages where you see things and then write notes about it here. And uh, when it comes to something like this about languages, you know, I'm definitely doing that because there's a whole lot of stuff that I found that I find really interesting. And, uh, and so I found myself just taking notes throughout the whole thing. So anyway, let me get into it a bit just to give you an idea what it's about. Uh, like I said, it's about languages spreading, why some languages spread and why some don't. Um, you'd think, you know, like some people say, well, it's just conquering and like imperialism, right? Um, you know, that's why English is spoken all over the place and Spanish and, you know, other places because, you know, they conquered and overtook and, and, and did all that stuff. And that's true. On the other hand, it's not just that. Like that isn't, you know, because if you think about it, the Mongolians took over a huge parts of the world and, uh, you know, none of them are speaking Mongolian. Manchurians did that. They took over all of China. The Qing dynasty is a Manchurian dynasty. And yet no one speaks Manchurian now at all, you know, pretty much within a hundred years, people stopped speaking Manchurian. Uh, the Turks uh, or Turkic people, I should say, um, they, uh, you know, they took over a whole lot of the world. And now a lot of places do speak, you know, do have something in common with them, but they don't speak Turkish. And, um, you know, so, so there are a lot of things that a lot of places where people took over, um, but the language never spread another another one if you think about it are, are the german tribes the, the you had the roman empire and then all these german tribes came and took over uh, all the way from you know italy to spain to northern africa even you know all of uh, france 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 is named after the franks which was a german tribe and uh, but none of these languages none of these places speak a germanic language they all speak romance languages so the latin from before stuck but you know, why did the Latin take place of the Gaulish languages, but Germanic didn't take place of the Latin? And um, anyway, and you have a bunch of stuff like this. Other people say it's business and trade that does it, but that's not true either. You know, you could say, oh, English became big because of business and trade. But the Dutch and the Portuguese, they had bigger enterprises than the Brits did, you know, in their time. And, uh, and their languages didn't stick, aside from Brazil. Um, you know, obviously Portuguese uh, stuck there. So why did... Why did this happen and in some places and why did it not happen in other places? Turns out it's pretty complicated. That's why you need a whole book to uh, talk about it. Um, by and large, you know, it's kind of like you would like you would think a, a, a not so fascinating uh, conclusion is that it's a combination. But, uh, you know, there is more to it. Like you need settlers to go there. It can't just be trade. It can't just be business opportunities. You need people who go there and, you know, want to establish their own lives there and they bring the language with them. But then you need a bunch of other stuff. Anyway, it, and, um, and it, it, 
yeah, so it gets more complicated. Like you kind of need the whole book to talk about this. And then he and he starts talking about other, you know, various interesting things. I have some of my notes uh, that I wrote up on my Goodreads, and uh, and I have a lot more of the notes here. I wrote up some of the main ones on Goodreads. Um, I, uh, what what do I have? What would have been different if Alexander the Great had gone west rather than east? This apparently is something people ask themselves because he did, you know, obviously he was fighting against uh, the Persians at the time, but then he kept going east. But he just as well could have gone west throughout Europe. And how different would Europe be now if he had done that? Um, then what else? Coptic, oh, Coptic version. Coptic, the, the word Coptic, which is uh, the uh, Christians in uh, in Egypt now. They're, they're called Coptic Christians and they also use a different language, uh, which is actually the closest to Old Egyptian that we have, which is basically the the Old Egyptian. It's a modern version of Old Egyptian. And Coptic, the word, comes from Aiguptos, which was Greek for Egypt. And anyway, that was interesting. Uh, what else does it talk about? Uh, the Ramayana is an old Sanskrit uh, story, and it has a story just like the Trojan War, uh, like a woman that was captured for her beauty and this, that, and the other. And so it's interesting, you know, maybe the Trojan War uh, took that part of the story from, uh, or uh, let's say the Iliad took part of that story from uh, from some old Sanskrit story. It talks about the Lugano alphabet, which I love because I grew up in Lugano, which is a town no one knows, and but the, apparently they have a Lugano alphabet, which uh, was a pretty big thing. Uh, what else does it have? Printed books meant the death of Latin. Basically, Latin had been spreading around um, all around, and it had been maintained throughout Europe. But because of printed books, suddenly people starting in Germany could print in their own language and they wanted to print in the language that people understood because with the printing press, with Gutenberg's printing press, you could suddenly print out pamphlets and, uh, and brochures or you know what have you for all the common people to read. And this is why stuff like that spreads, like Martin Luther's 95 Theses. He, he wrote those right when you had the printing press and so they could spread it around and spread like wildfire. It was like the internet of its day. Uh, what else? Oh, Christopher Columbus. Christopher Columbus thought he first thought he was in China in the in what was that back then the Mongolian Empire of the Khans. Um, and then he thought it was in India. But basically, after a month of arriving, he realized he was wrong on both counts and he stopped calling the locals Indios. But the name Indian stuck either way, just because of that month. And uh, and now, you know, they're still known as Indians um, incorrectly by many, by many people. Uh, I'm. I'm talking about the Native Americans, obviously. Uh, what else? Lingua, lingua franca this is an expression you hear all the time, and I've used it. I didn't know that it stood actually for the French language, which was being used in the Near East during the Crusades. They called it lingua franca. Um, what else? Uh, oh, and then, it, you know, and then it talks about the future of language spreading and what's going to happen. Like a lot of people think, well, it's English. Everyone's going to be speaking English, and that's it. But, you know, and there are a lot of things that point to how that could happen, but a lot of things point to how it might not happen. In fact, we're guaranteed that it won't happen forever because no language lasts forever. But uh, you know, the fact is most English speakers actually speak it as a second language now. And that's the main reason why it's so widespread because everyone's learning it as a second language. But it's also a big reason why it could die out because you don't feel a particular you know, affinity toward your second language. And all it takes is one generation to decide, oh no, I'm learning a different language as a second language and that's it. And it gets into the intricacies, like is English easier to learn than other languages? And maybe that's why people are learning it, but you know, that's kind of a weak argument. And uh, so anyway, it's, um, I won't get into it too much just because I, uh, I realized it doesn't have precisely to do with translation. I just really like this book. And so I just wanted to talk about it a bit. Once again, it's called Empires of the Word. Um, it's a language history of the world by Nicholas Oster, Os Ostler, sorry. And I'll, I'll link to my Goodreads account there in, in the description below because that's where I, you know, keep track of all the stuff I read. Um, and, uh, and yeah, that's pretty much it. There's, uh, I mean, there's a lot of interesting stuff in here. Oh, including the old Guarani word. Sorry. Okay. Uh, so Guarani is, um, is a language they still speak a lot of around Portugal and other parts of Latin South America. Obviously, it was a native language from there. Um, and, uh, and it's one of the more successful ones because quite a few people still speak it, which again, they speak it for a combination of reasons. Now I'm looking for my note in this because I don't want to miss out, but unfortunately I can't find it. So the Guarani word for money is, let me get this right. I'm totally going to mispronounce it, but Guarepoti, which 
literally means excrement of the mines, which kind of gives you an idea of what they thought of their new economy there that relied on all this money that the, that the Spanish people wanted. Excrement of the mines, that's the word for money. Cuarepoti. Um, anyway, I found that interesting. Either way, once again, this is the book and tune in next time for more videos. I have more to do with freelance translation and this is kind of just as an aside and an interesting book I read and which I highly recommend if you have the chance to read it. That's it for now. I'll talk to you next time. Thanks. Bye.